don't take people at face value when they say they can do something. <laughs> you know, I've, I've met a lot of yes people. Yeah. yeah, we can do that. We can do that. Yeah, that's fine. We can do that, and they can't. So I'm here with George, founder and boss hog of Serious Pig. Thanks for hanging out. Good to meet you, James. Yeah. So when did when did Serious Pig start? So you could trace the pig back to 2009, September, in a pub in North London. But really, we didn't get into full swing probably for two, two years. It was a bit of a hobby to begin with. And then, you know, the idea sort of started to solidify and we started to think about, actually, there is a business here. You know, it was more, I mean, it was always a business, but it was about how the hell we delivered it, you know, and that took a couple of years. So, um, in, 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 I suppose the true answer is probably 2011, 2012. So, yeah, coming up to sort of seven years now. And what were you doing before then? Oh. So um, I was head of buttons. Head of buttons. Head of buttons <laughs> at Paul Smith. Uh -huh. I was a, it was a self, um, I was self-appointed head of buttons. I didn't have a job title. But I used to look after all the, uh, the buttons and the trims and all that for Paul Smith, who's I'm still in contact with. He's, he's a good friend and he's, you know, I don't know if you've heard of, heard of Paul, but I imagine you, you, you probably have. Um, he, he's he's sort of global now, in fact, and really got a lot of presence in Japan. Um, and I've always looked up to him and I was born in Nottingham and he was born in Nottingham and the head office was in Nottingham and everybody that I know from Nottingham worked at Paul Smith at some point. So um, yeah, I looked after Buttons for a while <laughs> and then um, it was good fun actually. I was working amongst friends. It was, it was less of a job and more of a, you know, more of a good day out. Um, and then after that I started to work in uh, more high street fashion. So I, I worked for a company in the UK that had the license for Playboy clothes. So every person you saw in a Playboy t-shirt around about sort of 2000 and 2005. Sorry, that was my fault. <laughs> <laughs> and do you own any of those t-shirts yourself? I, I'm, there must be one somewhere. <laughs> there must be one somewhere. Um, after so that... So from buttons to Playboy t-shirts? Buttons, so yeah, fashion to fashion. And then I, had a, I, I bought a house in Nottingham and in the evenings I spent a lot of time sort of stripping wallpaper off and decorating and I sold it and then did it again. So in the evenings and weekends I was making a little bit of extra money and was lucky enough to sort of quit my job just at, at the time when I could see that Playboy was about to take a bit of a nosedive because they went and started licensing lots of plastic sort of hair dryers and things like that and it undermined, because the clothes we did were actually quite nice. You know, they were well made and, and uh, the price points were sort of middle market and then there was lots of other sort of tap coming onto the market and mm -hmm. I thought, okay, this is, this is time to get out. So I took two years out, um, did a bit of traveling around the world, almost all around the world. Mm -hmm. um, spent time in, in, in the Far East and China, lucky enough to go to Tibet and Nepal and India. So I had a great time and I came back. I thought I could get back into fashion, but since, you know, the credit crunch, there was no jobs. And uh, had, I didn't have a job for a while, so I thought, all right, I need to, I need to think. And um, I tried one thing. I've always had an interest in design, and, and that didn't work. Um, and then I, you know, I realised I was spending a lot of time in the pub, and I knew all about snacks and beer. So it was automatic that um, something, you know, in, in this world, sort of, uh, you know, uh, I finished up doing. So the idea for Serious Pig was born in the in the pub. It was born in the pub, otherwise known as a hall of great ideas. <laughs> yeah. I think a lot of good ideas come. Yeah, from exactly, there. exactly. Uh, well, they, what happens is you get peak, you get peak idea throughout drinking. You get really bad ideas, then really good ideas, and then the longer you drink, they go back to bad ideas again. So we, we got the top. Yeah. Three pints is sort of sweet, okay. sweet, sweet spot, good idea. Yeah, yeah. So you don't want a six pint idea? No, no. If, you, if in the morning you've written it down, just throw that idea away. It won't be a good one. Yeah, yeah. So, so you had the idea for Serious Pig, and if no one has heard of Serious Pig, what does Serious Pig do? So Serious Pig. Talking to sort of a, a beer audience and a craft, a craft uh, beer audience, I suppose we're doing for snacks what, what you have done for beer. You know, we're making craft snacks. So we're premiumizing snacks. So the snacks in the pub were typically, you know, low rent nuts or crisps or, or pork scratchings. And we thought, you know, we can do something better. Yeah. So we wanted to make a really a, a premium version of a pepper army. So like a nice top quality pork salami yeah. that was made using British pork, high welfare, and then the rest of the products sort of come off the back of that. So, so our world is, is serious snacking. Cool. And what other type of things do you do apart from the, the salami? So we, we started with the salami and then we quickly uh, developed a product called Snacking Ham, which is, is, is made similar to a salami but uses practically no fat. Fat's really important in salami for the flavour. Um, but you can great, get great flavour out of, of solid muscle as well. 
uh, with very little fat if you if you marinate it properly and, and, and obviously the flavors develop dur during maturation. Um, so snacking ham is like a lean salami that's then sliced really thin, so you can you can open the packet and share it. Um, it's not too dissimilar to probably jerky in the States. Um, and then we developed an oven roast pork crackling. So rather than like pork scratchings here in the UK, which is um, pork rind, which is fried, this was oven roasted, the same as you'd do if you're making a sort of Sunday lunch. Um, and then more recently, we've, we've, we've chosen to move away into non-meat snacks, which might seem weird if <laughs> we're called Serious Pig, but I, I, I disagree. I've always felt that the brand could be non-meat snacks. Yeah. I think if you're a serious pig, you're greedy, you know? Uh, the pig itself, its face, is serious, you know? It doesn't mean pork. If we were called serious pork, yeah. then yeah, I'd be stuffed. <laughs> um, so we've launched some peanuts and some almonds, which are amazing because they're seasoned with Cornish sea salt, which is the best salt in the world. And uh, this is a new product which we've just launched literally like in the last couple of days, which is snacking cheese, which is oven baked uh, cheese. There's no other ingredients. It's just straight up Italian hard cheese. that has been matured for 11 months and then baked and it is addictive. It's cheese crack. It's an amazing beer snack as well. Yeah. The salt, it's got some punch. You know, it'll work. Actually, we're excited about it because it'll work well on airlines because you need to have flavors up there that are just a little bit more potent because of the atmosphere in there. And we're having already some interesting bites from, from some of the big airlines. So when did you sell your first snack as Studious Pig? Oh, well, I guess it would have been, uh, I, well, I'll tell you what I did to begin with. Um, I, I went and bought some products, yep. some snack salamis, and put them into Serious Pig packets <laughs> to see, you know, test the market rather than developing, you know, the, you know, all the equipment and finding a supplier. Uh, so that would have been in 2009, yeah. 2009? And then, yeah, and then, and then people would have had to wait a couple of years <laughs> to get another one. <laughs> so 2009, and then when did Serious Pig kind of first hit with the products that you were making yourself? Uh, 2011, I think, well, we, we, we had to think really hard about production and how we could make salamis on a big scale. Uh, that took a little bit of, um, uh, of thought and a bit of investment that we didn't have and we had to sort of, you know, sort of borrow from Peter to pay Paul and we, we ended up building a, a piece of equipment that could produce 11,000 salamis in one go. And that came online sort of 2000, and, uh, sorry, yeah, 2012, something like that. But that was the turning point for the business. And then there was obviously lots of other bumps in the road, as you'd expect. Uh, but, but, but sort of any significant production began about then. So in terms of kind of leading the way in the kind of premiumization and kind of craftification of, of snacks in the UK, what's been the biggest challenges you've faced with Serious Pig over the last few years? Oh, how long we got? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the biggest challenge we've, we've had and, and it's a boring one, I'm sorry, it's not an exciting one, is the, the product has to stay uh, in an airtight packet, otherwise it will spoil. And so we need to use a material which has got a high barrier to gas and moisture, um, and that, when it's in there, needs to be sealed perfectly. And one of the challenges we had to begin with was we used people to pack for us because we didn't have the equipment to pack, and there was tiny holes, just tiny. They only need to be like an atom across. Yeah. And over time, oxygen will transfer in. And if there's oxygen in the packet, it's similar to, to beer, yeah. oxygen spoils it. And that was a challenge. And we thought we'd solved it, and then we hadn't. And we thought we'd solved it again, and then we hadn't. We thought we'd solved it again. <laughs> and then in fact, in one instance, where we print the date onto the, onto the back of the packets, it was printed with a, like a, um, a typewriter key. And it was a brand new key. It was a number three and it had a tiny manufacturing burr on it. And it, we didn't realize, but it was punching a tiny hole every time in the packet. So we was filling packets. I was like, you know, two in the morning, filling packets up with water and squeezing them, trying, oh. to, find, like, like trying to find a puncture on a bike tire. I was like, I found it. It's always on the three. <laughs> and what's been the biggest challenges from like a, a business perspective, what you've done? Um, I mean, I guess sort of post, bre uh, post credit, credit crunch, the banks, you can forget it. Yeah. You just forget it. They, they'll you know, lend you money if you can show that you don't need they won't it. Lend me, they wouldn't lend me anything, yeah. nothing. You just forget having a conversation, a waste of time. So we have to think creatively about raising cash. Um, so ca cash has been a, a, a tricky one early on, and it always is. You know, suppliers won't give you credit, so you, you know, you, you're, having to, you're having to finance everything on, you know, up front, um, and it's risky. But I don't mind risk, that, that's fine, but uh, you know, if it goes wrong, you're stuffed, you know, you've got to go cap in hand, and I've done that a few times. And if you look back on the Serious Pig journey, what's been some of the highlights of that for you? Highlights? Um, 
Well, getting listed in Brewdog, obviously. <laughs> That's got to be up there. <laughs> um, we, we've, we've had a, a, some big wins. Uh, mo- most recently, I know it's, 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 it's literally really recently, we've got a list in Tesco, so yeah. that starts at the end of this month, which is fantastic. Uh, we won a big deal um, to supply EasyJet a few years ago with, with some little salamis, so that got the pigs flying, <laughs> that got the pigs in the air. Um, I think... Um, just, just that sort of the satisfaction. It's more. It's less about the, the wins. It's more the satisfaction of getting the product out there. People liking it, and then you're going for a drink one night. You go to a pub, and you didn't know you supplied them because you're going for a distributor, and you see your product behind the bar, and you're like, okay, that's great. And you see someone over there, you don't know, eating it, and they're talking to their friend, going, oh, you know, like, try this. That, that's that's really satisfying. Yeah, I think for me, no matter like how tough the day's been or how many challenges I've had, if I can I go somewhere in the evening and see people enjoying the beers that, that we make? It's the same if you go somewhere and see people enjoying the snacks that you make. It just kind of puts everything in perspective and it's just yeah. a great way to kind of unwind up yeah. a tough yeah. day. It's, it, it is. It's, it's a bit of validation. No one, no one pats you on the back if you do <laughs> no. well in business in this country. They all just, you know, they, work, they, they will all be very pleased if you fail. Yeah, <laughs> they will be. Um, so that, that is sort of like a little, little pat on the back when you see it yourself. Yeah, yeah. okay. I think that's one of the big differences I've seen between kind of UK and, and, and US. If you if you kind of run a business and do well in the US, everyone seems to yeah. celebrate that success. Yeah. Whereas in the UK, it is the complete opposite. Well, they want you to to begin with, <laughs> yeah. and then when it looks like you're going to do it, they want you to fail, you know. And oh, I told you so, you know. What I, it's just it's strange. It really is strange. I, 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 you know, I would like to be. I'd like to be relive the whole thing in America. See where I, see where, where I am now. You know. yeah. but, uh, we are where we are. And if you could go back to George in 2011, what one bit of advice would you give him based on what you've learned in the journey over the last few years? Don't take people at face value when they say they can do something. <laughs> you know? I've, I've met a lot of yes people. Yeah. yeah, we can do that. We can do that. Yeah, that's fine. We can do that. And they can't. And I think that... I, I mean, look, I, I think I probably learned that before anyhow. I don't think it was a new, I don't think it took me to my 30s to learn that. But I was, there's was a lot of people in this industry that, that just, that, that for whatever reason, just think they can help you one way or another with your production. And, and um, if you really want something doing properly, you, you've got to just roll your sleeves up and do it yourself. Um, I think um, the other thing I would say is be prepared to say no a lot. I think you have to stay focused on what you're doing and, and there's opportunities that come your way which may seem great but in actual fact again it can be a distraction so learning to say no is, is sort of counterintuitive really but, but it's just as important as knowing when to say yes. In any growing business the workload is, is intense how do you how do you balance the amount that you work work-life balance and having a young family? So the, the biggest problem I've had since I've had, had kids is I used to work typically until at least one in the morning. Uh, that's, my brain works best from 9 p.m. to 1 a.m. It's yeah. a great period of, 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 of thinking, being creative, and, and now I've had to totally readjust that. Um, I think as the team grows, and I've learned to delegate more, that's helped. So there's a lot of stuff I was probably doing maybe that period of time, which I shouldn't have been doing. I still get my time um, a little bit on the weekends. I get time when I travel to be thinking uh, strategically. Um, but um, yeah, it balances up really well actually. You know, the, the, I get up earlier because the kids get me up. Yep. You know, that's unavoidable. <laughs> um, and when I'm up, I'm up. So I'm at work earlier. Um, but uh, I, I guess I guess there's a period like get the kids to bed, have dinner. I haven't got the energy then to work. So so I, I always try and ring fence now on the weekends and we'll do a bit of sort of creative thinking. And what does the future hold for Studio Pig? Um, I think for, for us now, it's just time to sort of really build on, on the good foundations we've, we've, we've set, you know. We've, we've had a few years of, of sort of, you know, just, just keep sort of grinding and grinding and grinding and we're getting to a point now where things are starting to flourish and I think what we're not going to do is distract ourselves with a ton of new products or changing direction. We talked about, I think I spoke to you about it a little while ago, about the full English breakfast idea and, and that would probably be too much of a distraction for I know yes it may work in the future but what people really know us about and know, know us uh, for is, is snacks. snacks and we've just got to sell more of what we've got we've got to build the sales up we've got to build all our brand advocates up we've got to get people talking about it we've got to get people eating it and we just need more and more there's plenty left in the UK market for us to go for there's a lot left so we're only just sort of 
scratching the surface. So uh, the future is about just, just growth on the product range that we've got. It's nice when you see someone eating it and you think, OK, that's one of them ones. It has to have come from us, you know? No one else has done the same thing. It has to come out of our little production place in, in Peckham. And it's gone all the way, even up as far as Scotland. And you see someone eating it, go, yeah, yeah, another, 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 another serious pig. Cool. Well, thanks for hanging out today and thanks for taking the snacks. Thank you, James. Pleasure. Cheers.